So when I was at community college and I was sitting in a uh, history class studying the Renaissance and the professor was talking about Michelangelo and in particular um, he was talking about a point in Michelangelo's life where he was carving a sculpture for a centerpiece for one of the popes. It was Pope Julius II, if I remember correctly. And Michelangelo had built, he had carved this sculpture, and it's, it's actually called the Moses. It's a Moses sitting on a throne with, um, with a, a flowing robe and a long flowing beard. And uh, anyway, the professor was talking about um, how when they unveiled this to the Pope, the Pope, that it was going to be the centerpiece of his tomb, that Michelangelo just kind of got down on his haunches and leaned over and just stared at it and didn't say anything. And it got really awkward. And, and finally, one of Michelangelo's students came up to him and he said, hey, uh, master, you, you have to say something. And he took his chisel and he threw it across the room. And he said a single word move because he was so passionate about this sculpture that he was like it's going to get up and move but at that time i sat there in this classroom and i thought to myself there's nothing in my life that i'm so passionate about that i would stand in front of the most important person of the day because you know the pope was like the president of the world and i was like there's nothing i have in my life that's like that so i decided um, that's when I decided to take a year off of school. I, I literally left that class and I went and bought a plane ticket to Europe. I knew that the, the Moses was in Rome and I could have flown directly to Rome, but I was like, no, I'm gonna, I wanna make it a quest. It was like, a, it was like my own personal journey. It was England and then France and then Spain and then, and then Italy. And when I got to Italy, I went down to Rome. And then I finally went to this little church on a hill that sits above the Colosseum. It's called San Pedro in Vincole. I went into this church and I see in the corner of the church in this like sort of dark shadowy corner, this, this form that I think, oh, that might be it. So I walk over there and there's a little box that you can put a coin in and it lights the thing up. And it's like this magical moment, like this moment out of a movie for me where I'm gonna see this Moses, it's gonna solve all of my life's problems. And I was like, eh, it's just okay. The problem with going to see a sculpture like that and having this idea that it's gonna solve what you wanna do with your life, it's gonna help you figure out everything, is you're putting way too much pressure on this like one object. So I walked out of the church and I sat down on the front steps and I was looking down at the Colosseum and I was thinking, you know, I really like seeing old stuff. So I'm just gonna make a little list of things that I wanna see. I wanna go see the pyramids in Egypt and Machu Picchu in Peru and um, Petra in Jordan. And I said, I'm just gonna go make some money and, and I'm gonna, when, when I make money, I'm gonna use that money to travel and see the world. That's what I did. I went to law school, I got done, and I went and started practicing law, and I got a TV commercial, and I started doing bankruptcy work, and everything was going really well. And I went to the pyramids, and I went to Peru, and I went to um, Jordan. And I, so I saw all this stuff that I had on my list. 2008, I got to, Machu Picchu, and it was the last thing on my personal bucket list. So I climbed up the mountain to Machu Picchu, and I'm kind of looking down at Machu Picchu, and I'm thinking like, I'm literally at the top of the world, like everything is below me. I've got my law firm, and it's making money, and it was 2008, and the economy was crazy, but we were doing bankruptcy work, so we were really busy. I came off the mountain. Uh, I checked my voicemail on a cell on a payphone, and there's this attorney that worked for me, and he had put in his two week notice and left me a voicemail. He was quitting, and I was like, "Wow, I'll have to deal with that when I get home, because now I'm only going to just going to be just me at the office instead of two attorneys." And uh, I so I started to feel kind of sick at the time, like I didn't really know what was going on, and so when I got home, I had pneumonia, and I, so I went to the med center, and they did some blood work, and I found out I had leukemia. Uh, and my white blood cell count was so high that we were pretty convinced I was dying. Um, I thought, you know, maybe I'll make it till Christmas. This is in September. I'm just hopeful I can make it till the end of the year. Um, and so that was a challenging time. But I have this personal life philosophy that I had started a long time before that. Um, when I was 17 years old, I decided to give up bad days. 
I don't know how or why. I just said, today's a good day. And then I wasn't a good day. And I said, today's a good day. And it still wasn't a good day. And I just kept saying that over and over and over again, 10, 20, 30 times a day. And then all of a sudden, one day I realized, you know what, today actually is a good day. It's like I trained my mind using affirmations. Like I, I didn't get diagnosed until 10 o'clock at night. Most of the day was pretty good. Right. So it wasn't that bad. So that day was good. And then the next day I was in the hospital and and it was about two in the afternoon and uh, there was a shift change. And this new nurse came in and she looked at me and she said, oh, my God, Jeff, I'm so sorry to see you here. And I looked at her and I recognized her and I said, oh, my God, Shelly, I'm so happy to be here because this nurse was my babysitter when I was a child and I hadn't seen her in like 20 years. And, and that was enough. It kept me from having a bad day that day. And that mattered because the next day, I, another thing happened and I had a good day. And then another thing happened. And I kept this string that's already at that point was 12 years. And now it's 25 years of no bad days. And when I look back at those days, yeah, they were harder than some days. But in other ways, it caused me to change my life. And by getting sick, it forced me to realize, you know, to recognize that someday may never come. Like I was always saying, someday I'll invest in real estate. Uh, someday I'm gonna do this, someday I'm gonna do that. But like life is super short. So I immediately, once I recovered, uh, technically I still have leukemia, but it's controlled. And so I take a one a day pill for that. But I, I was able to then, once I got back to being able to work, I was able to quit practicing law, take a job that I liked more than law. And, and I could take the cash that I made at that job and use it to invest in real estate and buy back my own time. And so that was really how I ended up a real estate investor was I wanted more time. I wanted to find a way to be able to do what I wanted when I wanted. Essentially, circling back to that moment when I was outside the church looking down at the in the Coliseum, what I really wanted at that point was I wanted the freedom that money could buy. And so I started by just buying single family houses with a with a friend. Um, I we, we paid cash because I didn't have any credit. I didn't have very much money. So we were buying in, in Detroit where property was very, very cheap at that time. And we got to where we had about 40 or 50 um, properties, somewhere, somewhere in that range. Uh, and we hadn't taken any money out. We were just constantly reinvesting. Every dollar that we got from the real estate, we just used to buy more real estate. And we just kept doing that 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15, all the way up to 2017. And I started looking around at opportunities and I realized that the real opportunity in real estate back in 2017 and, and frankly still today was in multifamily real estate. So then I converted my uh, search to looking for apartment complexes within like a month of uh of buying the first one we had already bought our second one and then a few months later we bought our third one and so after that it was just like off to the races so when when i started investing in multifamily real estate i quickly realized i didn't have enough money to invest entirely in these bigger deals on my own so i started looking for options to raise money to do that and and one of the things that we realized was that um other people would like to invest in larger multifamily properties for whatever reason could not. Maybe they didn't have enough money by themselves either, or they didn't have the experience or the time. And so so I ended up partnering with, with a good friend of mine, Brian, and, and Brian and I started um, a podcast called The Old Fashioned Real Estate Show. Uh, and what we do on The Old Fashioned Real Estate Show is we drink bourbon old fashions and we talk about real estate investing. So we kind of get drunk and talk about real estate. And the reason we did that, though, was because when we would meet people that were interested in the stuff that we were doing, we wanted to be able to point them somewhere and say, hey, check this out. You know, look at this video that we did look at this information we did. And then the other part of it was um, it allowed us to help people. I, I really felt like my life had gotten very good very fast. Once I started investing in real estate and not working a full-time job, um, 
I had a lot more freedom. And remember, that was the whole reason that I had gotten into real estate investing is I wanted to have freedom. And I went to Africa and I went to Ethiopia and Tanzania uh, and climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, um, the highest mountain in Africa. So I stood at the top of Kilimanjaro. And, you know, this kind of was circling back to like sitting on those steps at at the uh, at the church or sitting at the top of of Machu Picchu looking down at the lost city um climbing Kilimanjaro was kind of symbolic of you know you can go through this point in life where you don't know what you want to do and then you kind of achieve what you want to achieve and then things happen and, and your life gets in disarray but that doesn't mean that you can't climb to an even higher point than you were before and there's not much play there's not very many places in the world you can go higher than kilimanjaro i mean i'm not likely to climb everest but you know now i'm probably stuck doing it right so and i started thinking about how can people learn to do the things that i'm doing if they're not interested in real estate because you know some people just have no interest in investing in real estate and so i started thinking about that and i started writing a book and then i started telling people about um this philosophy that i call the last life ever philosophy the idea is that you only have this one time here on earth and this is your last chance um, in, in, in to get this life right. And, you know, even if you believe in, in reincarnation or whatever, you, you really only get one chance right now, right? And the idea is life is short. We get this one chance. Like we have to live the very best possible version of our life. And so I started talking about this to people and I mentioned it to one of the guests that we had on the old fashioned real estate show. Um, her name is Jillian Sidoti and Jillian is a securities attorney. So we connected because of our legal background and we're about the same age. And I told her about this, uh, this last life ever philosophy. And a few weeks later, she called me up and she said, Hey, I really want to do a show with you. And it was like the perfect storm of greatness because she's really, really well connected and really smart. And she's like, you know what, there is something more to life than just being a lawyer, which is of course, something I realized when I got sick, but now I had proof. I could talk to someone and say like, Hey, you know, it's okay. You make a lot of money, but life isn't about money it's about freedom it's about doing the things that are important to you and and really living that best version of your life and so we started a show called last life ever and that's a podcast and a youtube channel as well and uh, i'm that's like the next evolution of my my life it's my life purpose now is to help people live the best version of their life through helping them invest better in real estate and also helping them realize that they can do bigger and better things so we interview people doing amazing things like we interview like olympic gold medalists and people who walk the entire appalachian trail and people who write best-selling books and all that kind of really fun and interesting stuff to show our audience that you only get one chance to live this life and you owe it to yourself to your family to your community and yes even to the world to live the very best possible version of your last life ever. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Jeffrey Holtz and I approve this message. <laughs> Sorry, I just couldn't resist.